I'd like to thank the Farmed Out team not only for inviting me, but for asking me to talk about ADHD while offering this broader title of overprescription um, of psychotropics in children, because the two really go hand in hand, which I'll get into in a moment. But I'd like to say that my um, aim for the time allotted to me is to make the case for why we should be tracking and reporting psychotropic prescription rates at a local community level. And I hope to convince you that that might be really helpful in tack tackling the problem of overprescribing psychotropics, because this has been a problem that we've known about for two decades now, and it's getting worse with each year, and we're not making a dent in it. We're going in the wrong direction. So I said these two go hand in hand. Um, ADHD is not only the most common mental health diagnosis given to children, it's also the most common reason for initiating a child on a psychotropic. And although general practitioners write scripts for 80% of the cases, the diagnosis itself often converts many children into psychiatric patients. And ADHD has been implicated in all the prescribing conundrums you see listed here. And I think some of them you've heard in, um, come up in Yulia's talk and will be coming up in, in other talks um, or discussions throughout the day. But I'm going to focus on the first two, the prescribing cascade and the problem of ADHD, drug diversion, abuse, and addiction. So I spent a decade of my career studying the prevalence and impact of ADHD in southeastern Virginia, and that was 20 years ago. So that data is old, but it's actually still very relevant in several ways. First of all, the data, as I'll show you, makes, I think, very clear that southeastern Virginia was one of the epicenters for our nation's overprescribing of psychotropics in children, if not the epicenter for that. And Southeastern Virginia was also unique in that it's one of the few places that has ever systematically tackled the problem of overprescribing to children. And so I want to touch on that a little bit of what was going on 20 years ago in the community and what's happening there today. So briefly, I'm going to try to quickly go through the highlights of what um, research my colleagues and I at Eastern Virginia Medical School were finding. So back in the mid-90s to 2000s, the cities in southeastern Virginia were the top consumers of ADHD drugs. Hard to know what that really meant, but according to our research, we're finding, and when I go over these facts, I want you to remember that this was more than 20 years ago, 19% um, of the elementary school children in southeastern Virginia had been diagnosed with ADHD. When we looked at the group that's most at risk for the diagnosis, white boys, it was 33% of white boys in the elementary schools. And each year in school, a child is more likely to pick up the diagnosis. So among the middle school students, that rate was already up to 38%. The diagnosis was not inconsequential in that most of the children, 84% of them, were medicated for the disorder once diagnosed. And as you can see, many were heavily medicated. We had 28% of the children back then already on two or more different types of psychotropics, eight on three or more, and 1% on three, uh, four or more. Despite the heavy use of psychotropics, their educational outcomes were poor. ADHD-diagnosed children fared worse than non-ADHD-diagnosed children on some large um, educational outcome measures, but interestingly enough, we found that the ADHD-medicated students fared worse than the ADHD-unmedicated students. And those children who were young for their class compared to their classmates, what we called the young for grade students, were at enormous risk for being medicated for ADHD, 20 times more likely than their peers. And in Virginia Beach, that amounted to 63% of the young for grade children being medicated for ADHD. Now, today we know this as the birthday effect, which has been documented to exist in over 10 countries. And I think every place it's been examined except for one. And it doesn't matter whether this country's overall prevalence rate is high or low. It's a consistent phenomenon. What was really nice was um, that our community responded in a very robust way to these findings. At the time, I was a full-time clinician at the medical school doing the research on the side, eventually switched over to being a full-time research faculty member. But my concern was really improving care in the community. So I approached a local health director, 
all the leaders of um, school nursing services at the districts in the community and other key community kind of movers and shakers. And together, we formed a community coalition. Um, we were able to gather support, financial support for that. And it became large, open to the public. And we used the coalition input to really tackle this problem with the data that we had what, of what was going on in our local community. And based on community input, we would prioritize how to tackle the problem. And then we'd go write grants to get money to develop programs according to what the community want, implement them, and evaluate them. And it seemed like what we were doing was working. Over a four-year period, we saw a 32% decrease in the diagnosis and treatment of ADHD without any evidence of adverse harm for reducing treatment. And we had um, a variety of non-drug interventions that we were doing, like a USDOE-funded um, school-wide teacher training program. And what we found was the teachers who adopted that program had students who exhibited significantly fewer ADHD symptoms from the beginning of the school year to the end of the school year, whereas the teachers who weren't doing that had students who exhibited more ADHD symptoms over the course of the year. We also saw a 70% reduction in discipline referrals in the intervention school. And to our surprise, um, since we had nothing to do with the academic curriculum and weren't expecting to even have access to this data, um, the teachers who embraced the positive classroom behavior management strategies had students who scored significantly higher on every academic subject area assessed by the statewide SOL um, tests. So um, I'm going to, that was really exciting for our community. And I'm going to just put this abstract from 20 years ago up because it's literally 20 years ago that this came out. And what's significant about it is that with minor substitutions, what we wrote 20 years ago still holds true today. The first sentence, we talk about a 700% increase in psychostimulants in the 1990s. But today, all we'd have to do is substitute that and say, you know, exponential increases in every single class of psychotropics used for children. So it's not just that we're using stimulants at a great degree anymore with children diagnosed with ADHD. It's the whole spectrum of psychotropics. And that paper that goes with this really emphasized the fact that we don't get a clear picture of what's going on if we just look at national statistics because while it was kind of new information then, it's now very clear that mental health diagnoses and treatment rates vary enormously from one place to another. Um, for example, CDC, since this paper has started um, tracking ADHD, they included ADHD in their national um, survey of health issues among children. And we know, for example, according to the last CDC report, that 10% of children nationally have been diagnosed with ADHD. But if you look a little deeper, that rate varies from a low of 6% in California to a high of 16% in Louisiana. If you dig deeper, you'll find um, within, let's say, Louisiana, there are communities where the rate would be even higher. And now, instead of having a few isolated places like Virginia Beach, where you'd see a third of the white boys medicated for ADHD, there would be communities like that all around the country. But again, when we hear just 10%, it might sound too high, but you don't realize just how high that might really be for some children in some places. As you might imagine, reporting those kinds of findings and writing papers like that was not really well received by industry-funded ADHD experts. And the more I presented that information and the more I gathered media attention, the more I came under attack. Those attacks were very personal. They weren't scientific. I would have welcomed any of my um, colleagues, if you will, who were attacking me um, to critique my methodology and you know, give me insight to, as to why the findings might not have been accurate and the like, but they never did. They just questioned my integrity and credibility and the like. And that culminated in an allegation of scientific misconduct, which was a typewritten anonymous complaint submitted to the medical school. And the medical school, um, unfortunately, handled that very poorly in many ways. For example, um, the allegation, which was typewritten and anonymous, as I said, but I was never allowed to see because it would be too upsetting, 
was leaked to the press and a local reporter ran around town interviewing everybody who had been collaborating with me through the coalition or working with me in the schools on the research and pestering even journalists, journals, um, editors where I'd published papers, whipping up a lot of anxiety because apparently he really believed that as supposedly the allegation claimed, I had fabricated data to suit a personal anti-medication agenda. I didn't have an anti-medication agenda then, and I don't now, and the data had obviously not been fabricated. In the middle of the um, investigation, because of all the stir that was happening, the medical school dean decided to permanently terminate my CDC-funded research and wrote to the school district superintendents that that data would never be allowed to be used for any purpose. So that put the CDC in a position where it had no choice but to sever its cooperative agreement with me. And suddenly, a multi-site um, investigation of the prevalence and impact of ADHD that scripted off a grant proposal that I had written, I was not allowed to participate in anymore. But what's more disturbing is that um, the two sites that where the study continued, Oklahoma City with Mark Walrach and um, Columbia, South Carolina with Robert McGowan, published papers with the CDC talking about findings without ever mentioning that they had dropped one of the arms of their three-arm study from the protocol. And that was significant because by then we'd already collected the data and they knew the rates were much higher in Virginia than the other places. In fact, that was the goal was to pick a region that we thought would have a low rate of prevalence based on DEA data, a region with moderate rates, and a region with high rates. So it's just one of the many ways that the scientific record was um, corrupted. And as Dr. Elliott wrote in his short little paper that's really very succinct um, but important, Anatomy of Research Scandals, those who were actually, whoops, sorry, engaged in the misconduct in, in terms of trying to shut down legitimate research escaped unscathed. Well, you know, as an honors researcher, my career came to a screeching halt and all the data was buried and the coalition was destroyed. So that, that is unfortunately standard operating practice. Um, the journalist was given a copy of the um, official documentation clearing me of scientific misconduct, but chose anyway to publish a um, front page news story that left the public with the impression that I had unduly alarm them about high rates of ADHD diagnosis and treatment in the community. So that didn't help in terms of trying to move forward either. What I'm going to show you now is something that was in the New York Times um, last summer, and I think it really speaks to the fact that what was going on in southeastern Virginia 20 years ago is now happening in lots of places. So this is the story of Renee Smith, who, as a young teenager, was diagnosed with ADHD and put on a stimulant drug to treat the condition. After a few years, she became depressed and eventually so depressed she couldn't get out of bed. So as you can see, an antidepressant was added to her treatment regime and eventually multiple antidepressants, mood stabilizers, and antipsychotics. So young teenager diagnosed, put on stimulant. By the time she graduated from high school, she was on seven different types of psychotropics simultaneously. That is a, you know, unfortunately, probably classic example of a psychotropic prescribing cascade and um, really pretty tragic when you think about it. And apparently in the course of her treatment, nobody ever stopped to consider the fact that long-term use of stimulants can actually cause depression. So that's a phenomenon that we really need to keep in mind. So not surprisingly, now in the U.S., 40% of people between 2 and 24 years of age who are diagnosed with ADHD are on mul multiple psychotropics simultaneously. And ADHD is now implicated in 25% of the adverse drug reports um, involving children. One other thing that I think we really need to talk about is, um, you know, the ADHD experts who were attacking me were also very vocal about saying that use of these drugs prevents um, later substance abuse and they, you know, there's no association with um, potential drug abuse. That's really not accurate. 
But also we know that the more a drug is prescribed, the more it will be diverted for um, abuse and lead to addiction. And we've seen this for years now on American college campuses. Right now, 20% of college students admit to abusing ADHD prescription drugs. And just like the diagnosis, that rate varies enormously across the country with much higher rates at some colleges. But just this year, we had a paper come out that documented this is now a very significant problem, not only on American high school campuses, but also middle school campuses. So, And the problem is intensifying. The more the diagnosis rate goes up and the treatment rate goes up, the more the drug abuse rate goes up um, on high school and middle school campuses. Those schools that are most at risk are the ones, obviously, with the highest rate of diagnosis, and those tend to be schools in suburban um, areas where the school population is predominantly white and affluent. And all, what's interesting is um, now a lot of opioid addicts are reporting that ADHD prescription drugs were actually their gateway into drug um, experimentation, abuse, and ultimately addiction. So another friend of Farmed Out, Dr. Anna Lemke, um, wrote this in her book, Drug Dealer MD, which I think really summarizes very well what we're dealing with in terms of overprescription of psychotropics in young people. Many of today's youth think nothing of taking an Adderall, a stimulant in the morning to get going, Vicodin, an opioid in the afternoon to treat a sports injury, quote unquote, medical marijuana in the evening to relax, and Xanax, a benzodiazepine, at night to put them to sleep. And we shouldn't really be surprised about this because we have actually been encouraging parents, teachers, and youth to seek mental health through medicine. What I also find interesting is that Dr. Lemke put opioids and psychotropics together in one sentence. And I think that makes sense because all of these drugs are psychoactive drugs. They all will, when used long term, cause physical dependence. And when stopped, they're um, likely to, in, at least in a sizable portion of the patients, cause withdrawal symptoms that are worse than the problems for which the drugs were first prescribed. And as we know now, a lot of clinicians misinterpret those drug adverse effects and withdrawal symptoms as a deterioration in mental health, leading the patient to get more diagnoses and more prescriptions, as we saw happen with um, Renee Smith. So what's happening in southeastern Virginia today? Well, I would love to have the kind of data that we once had, um, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but I stepped out of the country for a few years and was teaching at a medical school overseas, and when I came back, I was horrified to see that ground had already been broken to build a $224 million, 14-story psychiatric hospital for children in my community, and that's the actual building it looms over the skyline of the medical complex at EBMS. Um, it was um, many years in the making and approved for construction in 2018. And the two major reasons that Children's Hospital King's Daughter, CHKD, the pediatric um, hospital affiliated with EBMS, used to convince legislators that this should be done was that more and more children and adolescents were showing up in hospital emergency departments with mental health crises, and those numbers had become unmanageable, and they were clogging the ED departments and getting in the way of dealing with other types of medical emergencies. And secondly, that there was an uptick in violence among children who had mental health problems. No, never have I heard anybody discuss the possibility that it's the drugs that these kids are on that are contributing to this uptick um, in ED visits or violence. But we recently had an opportunity to screen Medicating Normal, the film which, um, how many of you have seen Medicating Normal? Um, everyone here, if you're at this conference, you need to see Medicating Normal. Its director and co-producer, Lynn Cunningham, is here with us today. Lynn, where are you? If you might wanna just stand up and wave, wave your hand there. She has, because people will want to talk to her. The film is amazing in terms of addressing the harm of psychotropic overprescribing, particularly the long-term use of these drugs. But Lynn and her team is also doing a lot to um, take this film to communities and try to begin to generate some community action around it. So 
when she came to town and we had Bob Whitaker, who's here, um, and others speak to our community. We had over 900 people register to watch the film. Over 700 showed up. And to my shock, we got zero pushback from the community from basically the position that we were all presenting in the film presents that we are overusing these drugs and we shouldn't be, and we're not giving people informed consent. So um, out the day after, we sat down um, and spoke to a local emergency room physician to get his take on what he sees. And it's really rather disturbing. Um, he said most of the children who come into the emergency departments for mental health emergencies are already on a book of psychotropic drugs. Many uh, carry a diagnosis of a bipolar disorder. Lots of them are already on antipsychotics. And many identify with their diagnosis. Now, he's pleased that the presence of this hospital um, that comes with a telepsychiatry team helps to unclog his emergency department. But here's how that, what that means. The children who come in for psychiatric emergencies receive a 10 to 15 minute consult with the psychiatrist over the computer, which he says usually results in more diagnoses and more drugs and a referral to the psychiatric hospital. And that psychiatric hospital, um, you know, has been priding itself on the fact that it's recruited more child psychiatrists to the region. It increased the number of child psychiatrists from 1 to 19 for the opening. It's now up to 20. And it also advertises that it's open for business for clinical drug trials. In 2020 alone, they had 241 active drug trials, some of them for psychotropics with children. And as Jeannie Lenzer, who is also here, an investigative reporter, years ago came to town when I was coming under attack and um, uncovered evidence that's suggesting that it's actually the presence of a contract research organization connected with the pediatricians at Children's Hospital and EVMS that were in part driving what happened in terms of shutting down my research. So in a medical school, a Department of Pediatrics, typically a low-income earner, but they were top income earner there because of the clinical drug trials. So one thing we know is that, you know, shining a light on this kind of information can be helpful for motivating um, community action. We've seen it with patient safety, and I think we need to mandate that communities with psychiatric hospitals or CROs are forced to kind of report their data. To that end, we have written a petition, which is online. You can see it by going to change.org You can type in my name or the top, um, protect children, reduce over reliance on psychotropics, it'll come up. We posted it last week. We have, I think, over 400 signatures now. We're pleased Farm out, Farmed Out is a sponsor and pleased that Lynn um, Cunningham is a co author. So please um, at least read it and give us feedback. We can be still edited or updated. And if you're compelled, sign it. Thank you.